Hey, Dave here. In this video, we'll go into the BIOS of our virtualization server and take a look at some of the settings and make a couple changes and talk about the system overall. Now, right now I'm in the motherboard manual, the documentation for the motherboard. And uh, good documentation, by the way. And you might remember the ports on the motherboard and if we look here, we see we have an Ethernet port here and two more Ethernet ports here. So this one, number two, is used for administration. It's used for remotely controlling the server over the network from your workstation. And that's what you want to do. You know, if you have a lot of servers, it just doesn't make sense to connect to each one locally. So we connect to them remotely. And a great way to do that is with IPMI. And it shows it here. This is port number two. And down here in the description, IPMI LAN. So Intelligent Platform Management Interface. So this is how we remotely control it. We connect via this port. The other two ports are going to be used for data. That's where the virtual machines will be streamed out of. And you can see a picture here. I connected all three to my switch. And I'm going to set up link aggregation for these two so they can basically work as one network connection. And then I have the red, uh, the red patch cable for this guy here so we know which is which. So let's go ahead and connect to that now. We're going to connect remotely. And the great thing about this is you can control the whole system. You can control the BIOS. You can control the operating system, everything from your screen. So first thing we do is we connect from a browser and we connect to the IP address. Now, by default, this port is set up for DHCP. So it'll look for an address on the network from a DHCP server, which is really the way you should do it if you have a lot of these boxes. Uh, it just makes it easier for administration. But for me, or if you have a small office or home office, you may want to consider doing it static. I always do these static because I don't have that many devices. And it makes it a little bit easier for me to memorize what it is. I'm on 10.252.0.106, and I've already configured that. So when we connect, we don't have a secure connection. That's another thing altogether. We're going to have to work with the security for that to create a uh, secure TLS connection and uh, utilize a certificate. That's going to be later on. For now, I just want to get in and show the BIOS. So we'll log in. Okay. And that's going to show our system. It'll show the BIOS version right here. It'll show a preview of the image of the screen and anything you do here will happen at the system itself if you were watching the local monitor what you do here happens there so you have full control right through the browser and a couple ways to do that we can go to remote control and we can do this with a java connection if you have java on your system or you can do it with html5 using ikvm so if we click on that and then click the button for ikvm We'll get another screen here. And here's our screen where we're gonna enter the password. I'm just at the point where I need to enter the password to get into the BIOS. Enter that in now. And we're in. So this is our screen, this is our BIOS screen. So this is, just treat this as if we were at the local system. That's it, we're just remotely controlling it through the browser, utilizing that IPMI Ethernet port. So it's a great technology. So if we look here, the first thing we want to do is we want to know the BIOS version and the build date and check the product page to see if there's a BIOS update compared to this. That's really the first thing you want to do is change that firmware, update that firmware, or flash that BIOS if necessary. We did actually show the BIOS here as well in the uh, browser window. But uh, here is the product page for this particular board. And you can see a list of links and resources. And you have the update your BIOS, download the latest drivers and utilities, IPMI firmware, which you can update as well. So you want to check all these things. And here is the, there is a BIOS uh, update that you can download. But if we look at the release notes for this here, we see that the release version is 2.2. 2. 
and a release date 523-2018. And that is what we have here. We're running 2.2, 523-2018. So the board actually came with the latest one. But what I'll normally do is I'll go into my calendar or, or my tasks or the tasks within the calendar and set a time six months from now to check and see if there is a new update for this BIOS and incorporate the link as well. I'll incorporate that uh, link page here to get to the uh, resources and check if there is a latest BIOS. So make a note for that. But we look good. The BIOS looks okay. We should be okay. Otherwise, we'd want to download that zip file and then apply that to a flash drive and run through the BIOS update. And I show how to do that in another video. All right, so let's show the IPMI section and we'll just arrow over because this is keyboard driven. And by the way, this, uh, this is pretty cool, this IKVM. This is basically a virtual KVM. It has a little keyboard here that you can use, an on-screen keyboard. So you can do everything from here. You could restart the system, you can work in the BIOS, you can you know, hit any of these keys that you normally would, and so on. Put that down here for now. But anyways, here's IPMI, and we're at 1.41 firmware revision. I would check that as well when I check the BIOS. And we'll go down to BMC network configuration. Press enter. And by default, it would be set to dynamic and would grab an address automatically from a DHCP server. In fact, that's what it did. But I went in here and I changed it. And I pressed enter to actually update it. And then we can change it to yes and then modify the IP address and so on. Or change it back to dynamic if we wish to. Or utilize a VLAN if we wish to. But if you do set it statically, you need to know the IP address you're using, the subnet mask for the network, and the gateway IP address that you're going to connect out through. Whatever router or whatever to get out. Okay, but this is what I wanted. This is what I've set up already. So we'll set it back to no so we don't update it. Leave it as is. That's the IPMI connection. And it's a dedicated LAN connection. Remember, it's that port here. Dedicated LAN connection. That's what you want on a server so that you can remotely control these. Now, I had wanted to use an add-on video card. But IPMI doesn't work well with the add-on video card for the IKVM program and also for Java. Uh, it only works well with the built-in SVGA port. It sees the other card and it works fine locally, but not through IPMI. So let's uh, show that setting for the video card in the BIOS here. I'm gonna escape out of this and we're gonna go to advanced and go down to chipset configuration, which is a common place we'll be, press enter. And then we'll go down to system agent configuration and press enter. And this is where we want to be. And by the way, uh, virtualization is here as well. So, and this is going to be a virtualization server. So we need that. This is an Intel box. So we're using VT D, virt Intel virtualization. So we want to make sure that is enabled. It was by default. If it was disabled, we wouldn't be able to run uh, our virtualization software. But we want to go down here to the uh, graphics configuration, press enter. And then we see the primary display and we have some options for this. We'll press enter. Now it's set by default to PCIe and that means it's a little confusing. That means that that is the onboard SVGA adapter that's on the motherboard. And that's what we have to use for IPMI to work properly. But to use a separate card locally on the system, you'd have to set it to PEG. That's for add-on cards. And it actually sees the PEG card. It sees that card that I added. It's on slot six. That's the by 16 slot. And those, those black slots on the motherboard that we showed before, the PCI Express slots, they're labeled, uh, they're numbered four, five, six, seven from right to left. So we can use this, we can use it locally, and there's ways to get around it uh, to work with 
the system and to work with IPMI, but it's kind of an in-depth workaround and it really isn't necessary. If you're doing this in the field, you wouldn't even utilize video on the box. Um, only if you had to connect and they give you that SVGA to connect to for that. So we're going to leave it as PCIe. And I did want to have a connection for video. So one of the things I actually picked up was this adapter here. This is a VGA to HDMI adapter so that I could connect this to my KVM switch, a physical KVM switch for all my servers. And that only does HDMI. So this connects to, this connects to the SVGA port on the server and then it's got HDMI on the other side and you connect the HDMI cable to that and it uses USB for power so you have to have it comes with a little USB dongle so that, that connects to the USB port um, and this actually works very well locally so uh, no problems there that actually works out there's lots of other options for that again if I was in a large scenario I wouldn't even consider this I wouldn't even worry about it uh, if I had lots of computers but I'd like to be able to connect to this from the KVM switch uh, locally as well, just to be able to see it on a bigger screen, or if we have to do any troubleshooting or changes to it. So again, not necessary if you're truly going headless, meaning no keyboard, mouse, or monitor. So we'll leave it as PCIe, escape out of there, and escape out of here. And so I'll be getting rid of that video card that's in there, I'll use that somewhere else, um, and probably just stick with that adapter. Okay, now one of the other things, you might actually hear the server right now. It's right behind me. So the fans are pretty loud. The fans that we connected that are stock in that case are fairly loud. And we can't actually do any remote monitoring of those. If we go to server health and go to sensor readings, and this is the connection to through the browser to that system, uh, these aren't set up yet. I need to set these up in the BIOS, but even if they were, all we would be able to get is the system temp and we wouldn't be able to see the fans because they're not connected to the motherboard. They're just connected via Molex to the power supply. So there's no real way to uh, monitor those fans and they just run at full speed. So they make a good amount of noise. And this was a concern before. I was kind of prepared for that. So I've got these other fans here. This is uh, Noctua, and there's a lot of companies that make other fans that are quieter. And this is a this is a four pin fan, but it's four pin connecting to the motherboard, not to Molex. These are 80 millimeter, so this is the size that I need. And so these can be controlled on the motherboard once we set that up, so that they don't run at full speed all the time. Not only that, they're quieter in general. So I'll probably swap out the three fans. It's uh, it's almost a $50 investment, but it's worth it for this case. Now, if the computer is in a server room, it doesn't really matter that much. You want it running at full blast, and you don't really care about the noise. That's how server rooms are. But if you have it nearby, if you're in a small office or home office, or like me, you have it right in your lab, and you're doing recording, you don't really want that uh, coming through. So quieter fans also they'll run and quieter at full speed but they also can be controlled via the motherboard so that they can be throttled down when they don't need to run at full uh at high power they can be throttled down and be even quieter so i'll probably be doing that upgrade i connect them directly to the motherboard so that i can monitor them from here once i set up all the monitoring and they make other types of things too, where you could connect fans from Molex to uh, three or four pin on the motherboard. They make adapters for this. I'm not really too much into using adapters for power inside of a, a computer, for especially a server. So most likely I'll go with this. It's a more expensive uh, option, but this is a $1,500 box. So it's worth putting the additional $50 of fans in there, in my opinion. Um, again, a more, a higher level case would have gone beyond this. Okay. So a couple other things we want to do here. We want to make sure that our CPU is running at the correct speed. If we go to advanced and go to CPU configuration, we'll see that we have it seen as a 3.7 gigahertz E3 1240 V6. 
And the V6, the version 6 of this chip, wouldn't be seen if we had the older version of the BIOS. But uh, they actually updated that at the manufacturing plant. So we see here minimum CPU speeds 800, maximums 3700. And that's exactly what we want. So that's good. From here we can make a lot of modifications. Hyperthreading is enabled. We want that. Intel virtualization technology, again, VT-D, that is enabled, and lots of other settings. Okay, we also want to watch the events that are happening. And if we go to event logs, we can view, uh, we can change the settings, and we can also view the event log. The only event that's here is before I actually got the board. This was at the plant when it was manufactured in October. So that's just the standard uh, event log, just to make sure it works and the severity is not applicable because it's testing. Another thing we want to do is go to security and change the password and make sure that we change it to something that is complex, and I've already done that. And we also want to take a look at the boot options. And if we look down here, we'll see the first on the list is hard disk, CT120B. That's the 120 gigabyte uh, crucial solid state drive that I put in there. And if we arrow down here to hard disk drive BBS priorities, press enter, we'll see the other drive as well. It does see the Western digital drive that I put in there, the one terabyte magnetic drive. So we want to make sure that it sees each of these. Um, we could possibly boot from that, but we're not going to. That's going to be the backup drive. Okay, and when we're all done, we'll go to save and exit. And you can do this with F4, or we can go down to Save Changes and Reset. And we'll say Yes. And that will restart the system. And the fans turned off. And they turn back on. And the beauty of this remote connection through the browser is you can see everything that happens that you would see locally. You can see the splash screen here. You can see the BMC IP. That's for IPMI. That's for the remote management on 10.2.2.0.106. And you can see all this. So pretty cool stuff. You can also use your keyboard or use the on-screen keyboard and press the delete key to access the BIOS. There we go. And enter our password. Press enter. And we're back in. So our changes have been saved. Everything looks good. Our system is updated. Uh, the only thing I'm going to have to check is the M.2 drive. I'm not too worried about that just yet. Um, I have a feeling once we get the operating system in there, it'll see it. But if not, we'll have to do some additional configuration here. And again, you would do that in advanced. And you'd either go to the chipset configuration and go here. Or we'd go to PCI Express configuration and change it from there. There's a couple locations in a BIOS that you can you might have to make configuration changes for newer cards, like that adapter card that I have that's holding the M.2 drive. Okay, so I'm not going through the entire uh, VMware installation. This is an ESXi 6.7 uh, VMware operating system I'm installing. Uh, I'm not going through that whole install because it's it's beyond the A+, plus, but I just wanted to show this section here. Now, what I did was I downloaded the OS and uh, used Rufus to uh, put the ISO onto a flash drive and uh, booted off the flash drive from the BIOS, which it saw fine, and it showed it as a SAN disk in the BIOS. So that's basic stuff. I show that in another video. But when I booted, it uh, came into this screen here on where to install the uh, VMware server. And so it sees all of these drives. So I just wanted to show this. Uh, this first drive is the crucial, the 120 gigabyte uh, drive that I put in. That's a 2.5 inch solid state drive. That's where I'm going to install to. But it sees everything else, which is cool. So we don't really have to do anything else in the BIOS. It sees uh, the Western Digital Drive. That's the magnetic disk, which I figured it would see, but it found the Samsung SSD 970. So this version of VMware actually knows what that is and sees it in the firmware, knows how to ac access it through that adapter card that I installed. 
so it sees that as well. So we should have no problems setting up the virtual machine store because that's where that's going to go. And of course, it sees the SanDisk drive. That's what I'm installing the operating system from. But that's actually where I'm going to go to do the install. Well, I completed the VMware ESXi installation, and I did some configurations already. By default, this server grabs an IP address from a DHCP server, but I changed that to static, 10.252.0.108, and I connected to that with the browser. Once again, we, we're going to have to work on security for this, but that's a another concept and video altogether. So we're going to log in now. Default is root and I apply the password, of course, and we're in. So you get a snapshot of what is happening here and uh, how much CPU usage and memory usage and storage so far and basic information about the server. So it calls it a super micro super server. And that's their motherboard series. And we've got our CPUs, our memory, and so on. Now, one place to go to really see a lot of what's going on in VMware is to go to networking. And inside here, by default, you get something called vSwitch0. So we'll take a look at that. And I've modified this a little bit. And if we scroll down here, we'll see the topology. So this is the vSwitch topology, the virtual switch topology. On the right hand side, we have the actual physical network adapters. So we have those two ports that I showed previously, where we have the uh, two patch cables connected to the switch. So we've got these two gigabit ethernet ports. So they're working together. They are teamed together now to work with this VMware vSwitch. And on the vSwitch, what you have is you have the management network, and that's what you actually connect to when you connect in the browser to that IP address. And green here means that we're active. And then that's basically what you connect to to do all of your management, to modify the VMware server, to create virtual machines, and, and so on. And then you also have the virtual machine network, the VM network. So all the virtual machines would be listed in here by default. Now you can really go and do a lot of configuration here. And, you know, people and companies will make a lot of changes to this based on what networking and what systems they want and how they want them connected. So this system is just the first VM that I created just to make sure it works. Uh, that's off right now. And you can see this is white, so we know that this is turned off. But all your VMs would be listed here. So this is very similar to Hyper-V or to VirtualBox, but a little bit more because now we're actually showing the server side. And this is a Type 1 hypervisor that allows direct connectivity of the virtual machines to the hardware. vSwitch topology, this is all the networking happening right here. Uh, another place to go is the storage. And if we look here, I've created the data store. And that's where the virtual machines will be uh, stored. And by default, this puts this on the drive that you installed the OS to, which I don't want. I just want the operating system to be separate. So I got rid of that and modified it to the M.2 NVMe one terabyte drive. And so that's, that's what I called it. And there it is. And then you can create virtual machines. And you can create those from here, but you can also do it from VM Workstation, which is most likely what I'll do for the most part. And I already have some virtual machines. And what I'll be doing is I'll be uploading those to here. You can either upload them or export them. Uh, you just want to make sure that they are compatible with this uh, server. So I'll be uploading those and changing some of the settings and get all the virtual machines in here on this one computer. And I'll be able to connect to it from my main workstation or from any other system uh, on the LAN or over the internet once I have it configured. That's basically it. Uh, the VMware server is running. It looks good and uh, no issues. 
Uh, it does say we're in evaluation mode. I just have to put the license in. It's a free license for this. So I just have to toss that in there and a couple other configuration changes and a couple additions and get those VMs in there and the whole thing will be ready to go. So it's running flawlessly and I'm loving it. So that's about it for this video and for this lesson. Again, this goes a little bit beyond the A+, but I like to kind of close it out by showing why I was building the system and what I'm going to be doing with it. So that's about it. This is Dave signing off.